everybody, this is Terrible Dactyl, and welcome back to Jurassic Plastic. I'm here with my good friend, the Carnegie Collection 2006 Caudipteryx by Safari LTD. This is one of the first feathered dinosaur models that Safari made in its Carnegie Collection line, and possibly in any of its lines. I don't remember very many feathered dinosaur models at all being made by any of the major brands before uh, 2006 and at that time Safari released not one, not two, not three, but four or I guess even five if you count the Oviraptor which came out around the same time of these uh, feathered dinosaurs in their line. So this was really the year of the feathered dinosaur model and you know, this Caudipteryx, I want to start out by saying I really, really like this model. It's it's a beautiful model. It seems to be based on the classic color scheme of Caudipteryx uh, with this sort of iridescent green, uh, dark colored body with a blue head, blue feathers on the wings and on the tail. It's big. I like it. In, in a way, I do like how big this model is. It's one of their largest feathered dinosaur models, ironically enough, considering that Caudipteryx is a very, very small dinosaur. When you measure this from nose to tail, this model, if you go to where the tip of the physical tail would be, it's around 14 or 15 centimeters long, and calculating that out, this is actually a one-sixth scale model. So this is actually in scale with that old Safari Velociraptor from 1993, which I remember thinking, wow, this is a, this is a big piece of dinosaur right here. You don't see too many one-sixth scale, uh, medium, small to medium sized dinosaurs like this. Um, and that's it's nice to have it that big to be able to bring out these details. But I do have, you know, I'm conflicted about this model, as you can probably tell. There are pros and cons to this, so let's get into it. The sculpting on this is absolutely gorgeous. Forrest Rogers really killed it with this model. Uh, making it bigger really did allow a lot of these details, like the beautifully done feathers take a look at the feathers on the wing. Not only is each feather individually sculpted, you can see the barbs on the feathers. These little shaggy outlines of each and every feather here have been individually done. They're present on these coverts here, which transition nicely into these shaggier uh, coverts on the arm. The feet are very nicely sculpted with not stereotypical big broad bird-like scoots which actually could be slightly inaccurate for a model like this because those broad scoots really don't start showing up in a widespread way until you get to the ornithuromorph birds um, if you look at animals like concavenator um, they, they do have scoots, which this does, but they're in multiple rows and they're very small. Looking at the tail, the tail feathers are just as nicely done as the wing feathers. The tail is bifurcated, it's split into two halves, which you will see in some reconstructions, although not all. Um, I'm not sure how well supported that bifurcation of the tail is. Um, if you actually look at the tail feathers on the fossils of Caudipteryx, the last tail feathers um, are actually not the longest. Now that is an inaccuracy on this model. You would see one or two feathers on the interior of this V that are shorter than the longest two. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say that that's probably accurate, although the execution of that idea here is a little bit off by not including shorter feathers on the interior edges of that V. 
This is in the classic late Carnegie tripod pose, retracted neck, head pulled back in the air, screaming into the void, which it seems like almost every single Carnegie theropod model was doing during the 2000s and 2010s. I'm not sure if it was just easier to have them balanced that way. You can see that the tail doesn't actually touch the ground. It is stable enough to rest on the halices here, which are not reversed, which is good. It would have been tempting for a sculptor who uh, was less versed in this grade of theropods to make this a reversed halix. You can see that it is just angled backwards to support the weight of the body. And the pose works, don't get me wrong, especially when you look at it from the back which has the more interesting color scheme. Displaying this one from the front, you're really missing out on a whole lot of the charm of this model because it's just this plain off-white plastic with a little bit of white airbrushed here onto the breast feathers. Um, but if you were to display it like this, as if it was kind of cocking its head backwards, towards the viewer. You're really getting the full effect of that color scheme. Um, the color scheme here, as I mentioned before, is really nice. You've got banded detail on those blue feathers with these black stripes going across. Now, this is actually pretty much accurate based on the Caudipteryx fossils that we have. There is evidence of a banded pattern in the feathers of the tail and possibly even the arms a little bit. Um, it would have been a much tighter banding than this, more like the feathers of a hawk or a turkey. At least it's a nod to the correct coloration. We'll give him like half credit for that one. There's a little bit of white highlight here on the inner feathers of the wings. And as I said, they really pulled off that iridescent effect on the body feathers. Now, whether or not simple shaggy body feathers like this could achieve a degree of iridescence may be a little controversial. You do see a glossy sheen, which is similar to iridescence in the feathers of cassowary. Um, not to this extent, though, and not really a different color. And the head is very nicely sculpted. It does not have scales, which is another thing that uh, some sculptors are tempted to do is put big dinosaurian scales on there to give it a lizard head, like old 19th century and 20th century reconstructions of Archaeopteryx. But once again, looking at modern birds, when they lose the feathers on the face, they don't typically have scales there. And if they have something that looks like scales, it's really just small bumps or caruncles on the skin, like you see on the skin of a turkey. And it has this nice little splash of red around the jawline and onto the throat, which is a nice little display feature. The inside of the mouth is painted pink. The beak is painted dark gray or black. It's a little, little ill-defined, at least on one side on my model. You can see that the paint application there is not quite the best and the beak is not really indicated at all on the lower jaw. Now, Caudipteryx did have teeth. Uh, whether or not it had a really solidly defined beak as well, I don't think we know that for sure, so I'm not too concerned about the lack of real indication of a beak here, and, and only a slight indication here. This could even just be coloration or keratinized skin on the end of the nose. The eyes have this wonderful surprised look and the eyes are way more detailed than most Carnegie models where you've got not only a black outline around the orbit but a little bit of red on the inside of the eyelid and then you've got this beautiful glossy orangey eyeball with a black pupil. Now, I do have some reservations about this model. First of all, scientifically, you know, this is one of the first real mass-produced feathered dinosaur models, so I have to cut it a little bit of slack, but on an 
fossil as well preserved as caudipteryx, there's really not much excuse for completely botching the forelimbs like they have done with this model. So you can see there are very clearly one, two, three fingers here. Strike one. Caudipteryx actually only had two fingers. The third finger was very, very small and inflexible and splint-like and was probably fused at least via soft tissue to the second finger. So three fingers, uh-uh, no, no. Second of all, as you can see, the wing feathers do not actually attach to any of the fingers. The outermost wing feathers, if you trace them right back here, attach to the wrist when they should be attached to the at least the first half or first third of that middle wing finger here when in fact the fingers would be part of the wing and the longest feathers on a real caudipteryx are actually the ones that attach to that second finger so caudipteryx has kind of a lozenge shaped wing where the long feathers come off of the finger like this and then you've got much shorter wing feathers, probably only as short as these inner coverts here, going uh, up to the elbow. And they probably would not reach all the way in with the arm extended like this, all the way into the body to complete an airfoil. Obviously, this is not a flying animal. And uh, unless you are a soaring bird, you're not going to have feathers like this, called tertials or tertiary feathers, attached to the upper arm bone. The final drawback that I want to talk about, even though I praised it for this earlier, is its size. One of the things that I really am frustrated with in the later Carnegie Collection models is the lack of a consistent scale. Now, I don't mind doing larger figures so that you can show more detail in very, very small animals. Would it have been cool to get a tiny, tiny little caudipteryx, maybe even a flock of caudipteryx on a nice base similar to what we used to get back in the 80s with like the Deinonychus and the Protoceratops? Yes, that would have been cool. That probably would have been my main preference. I understand that with the kind of market that we had by the time that this figure was released, that that was not going to happen. However, you had a wave here where Safari came out with several different feathered dinosaurs, all from the same time and place it, during the same year or two. And still, even within that subset, we don't have a consistent scale. It would have been nice if they put them all in maybe a 110 scale, maybe a 115 scale, like the original Australopithecus and uh, Smilodon. This is the Carnegie D-Long. And D-Long was one of the larger feathered dinosaurs, much larger than Caudipteryx. And these two figures were released at the same time. Now I know Caudipteryx has more opportunity for more detail and a more beautiful paint application. But if you switch the sizes of these two, like so, they would have been in scale. I don't really understand what Carnegie and Safari were going for by releasing a whole set of figures and almost each figure was in a different scale. I think the Microraptor is actually in the same scale as the Caudipteryx. I'm not sure if the D-Long is in scale with the Bapiosaurus. I don't have that one. Uh, the D-Long is in scale with some of the other Safari feathered dinosaurs like the Oviraptor and the Velociraptor, uh, which is nice. It's just odd that we've got these models that you really would want to display together. These animals lived in the same habitat. And yet, it looks kind of funky when you do, because the really small turkey-sized one is enormous, and the one that's more of the size of a large dog or a wolf is teeny tiny when you put them together. But overall, I have to say, I can still recommend this Carnegie Caudipteryx. If you can track it down, it's not the cheapest anymore, but you can usually find a good deal on it if you look on eBay. Um, I think uh, last time I checked, D. Jenkins even still has these in stock for pretty much retail price plus shipping. And still, this is the best model of Caudipteryx you're going to get. Could we use an update to this 
figure. Yes, and I hope, I hope, hope, hope that Wild Safari at some point does revisit Caudipteryx and some of these other feathered dinosaurs that they did in the Carnegie Collection. Hopefully putting them even all together in the same scale like they've been doing for some of their prehistoric mammals. Um, but as of right now, this is the best you're going to get. And it really is a nice looking model. Don't get me wrong. Scale issues aside, a few scientific inaccuracies aside, it's really nice. It's a really nice display piece. I just wish it were a little smaller. Thanks for watching.